The premise of the book as a whole is that there's a machine that exists in the world that tells you how you're going to die. And so each story in the book is about a different person and the prediction that they devoured by lions. Mrs. Murphy, I will have you know that I am to be torn apart and devoured by lions. Simon Fennig was fully aware of how strange he must sound. He had no choice. It was too exciting not to share. There came a startled pause on the other end of the line. Might well be expected, thought Simon. He imagined her there, sitting in her parlor. Do people even have parlors anymore? Listening to the salesman on the other end of the line, droning on and on about Company X's jolly new life insurance policy for citizens over 50, about the security it would bring to your family were you to suddenly keel over stone dead and how content you'd be as the final darkness was falling, that you'd at least managed to avoid becoming a big, fat financial burden. And suddenly, bam, out of the blue, he drops a line like that. Damn straight she should be startled. Eventually, the silence on the other end of the line was broken. Excuse me? Mrs. Murphy eventually managed. I, said Simon, am to be torn apart and devoured by lions. Mrs. Murphy, weren't you just talking to me about insurance a moment ago? I was, said Simon. Now I'm talking about lions. Oh, said Mrs. Murphy, apparently unsure of what to make of all this. Did you know that an adult male lion can consume up to 75 pounds of meat in a single meal, and that said meal will often have to last him an entire week? I, er, did not. That would be two whole meals out of me alone, said Simon. I'm guesstimating a bit because I am not made entirely of meat. Well, who is, replied Mrs. Murphy, gamely. Exactly. For one thing, there's the matter of bones. I'm not quite certain how much my bones weigh. Lions don't eat bones. They leave them behind for the hyenas to consume. But you see, doesn't matter as much to me, Mrs. Murphy, because I am to be torn apart by and devoured by lions, not hyenas. So you said. I will be long dead, said Simon, before the hyenas ever get a hold of me. Aha. Uh -huh. Naturally, though, I don't expect myself to last the whole two weeks. Far from it. After all, as you know, I am to be torn apart and devoured by lions, plural, not a lion. And it is uncommon for male lions to travel together unless they're roaming the savannah in unwed bachelor groups. Simon leaned back in his chair and studied the single fluorescent fixture mounted above his tiny cubicle, imagining it for a moment to be the red-hot sun of the Serengeti. No, he continued, far more likely I am to be torn apart and devoured by lionesses a group of huntresses intent on bringing food back for their Leonine patriarch. I see. As you might expect, Simon went on, I've given this some thought, 
and I have eventually come to the conclusion that the word lions doesn't necessarily refer to the male of the species ex exclusively. Good news for me, you understand, because I must confess to harboring this romantic notion of how it will all play out. Mrs. Murphy smiled into the phone. You could hear it in her voice. Just got your prediction today, did you? Actually, said Simon, it's been seven weeks now. Oh, said Mrs. Murphy. But I'm sorry, you're quite right. We should probably go back to talking about life insurance now. Simon cleared his throat, straightened his tie, and put his salesman voice back on. It was a good salesman voice, keen and enthusiastic and it bore shockingly little resemblance to the one he'd been using his entire workaday life up until that day about two months ago, the day Simon now liked to call Torn Apart and Devoured by Lion's Day. Mrs. Murphy, the new, exciting Simon began, did you know that in the event of your sudden accidental death, your family might incur miscellaneous costs of upwards of... Ah, see, there, said Mrs. Murphy. I'm sorry. I was waiting for something like, just like that. I'm to kick off from colon cancer, lad, not a stroke or a heart attack or anything quick like that. Plenty of time to get my affairs in order. A common response these days, Simon knew the company wrote. Many of our potential customers come to us with this same story, Mrs. Murphy, said Simon. Truth to tell, though. Though you may believe that you know the circumstances surrounding your eventual demise based on your prediction alone, the fact of the matter is that the specifics can often be surprising to both you and your loved ones. Mrs. Murphy chuckled. Come now, she said. Have you ever heard of anyone crossing the street one day and getting hit by a runaway colon cancer? Simon had to admit that he had not. I'm fairly certain that I'm destined to pass away peacefully in a hospital bed, lad, said Mrs. Murphy, all shrouded in white and surrounded by my family, probably in some pain too, mind, but there's little helping that. Mrs. Murphy, if I might. Lad, said Mrs. Murphy, I have my fantasy just as you have yours, and I am unwilling to cheapen it by banking on the possibility that the chips might not fall that way. Her voice smiled again. You clearly have one of your own, and I think that if you think about it, she said, you'll understand. Simon thought about it, and he did. Well, he said after a moment, good day to you then. To you as well, said Mrs. Murphy. May God bless, and say hello to the lions for me. Will do, Mrs. Murphy, said Simon. There was a click as Mrs. Murphy disconnected the line and then a low, steady drone. Dutifully, Simon's auto-dialer started in on another number. Dude, said Scott, the, uh, the guy in the cubicle next door, you gotta cut that out. Armbruster is going to be mighty horked if he ever catches you in the middle of that. Simon pulled his chair closer to his desk, fully intending to ignore his wallmate, as per usual. After all, he had insurance to sell. You can't let this death machine crap run your life, man, continued Scott, heedless as Simon waited for his line to pick up. I mean, jeez, look at you. Ever since you did that stupid prediction thing, you've gone, like, totally mental on us, with the suit and the tie and... Simon's line picked up. It was an answering machine. Simon dropped his headset to his neck for a moment and rolled his chair back. And customers can hear the tie. Scott, said Simon, just like they can hear a smile. Uh-huh, said Scott. So, do you suppose they can hear this little stain here on my shirt, too? I believe they can, said Simon. Wow, said Scott, with feigned amazement. Those are some really keen ears right there, Simon. He snickered and spun his chair around a couple times. Dude, you have lost it, man, he said. Simon pulled himself back to his desk, replacing his headphones just in time to hear the answering machine disconnect. To each, he said with measured patience, his own. I'm sorry, what? said Scott. I couldn't hear you there, dude. 
between my stain and your tie. There's just too damn much noise going on around here. Speaking of which, Simon just shook his head as the auto-dialer worked its magic again, preparing to serve him up another golden opportunity. It was hard to get too angry with Scott about his little jibes. After all, thought Simon, Scott was likely bored and a bit depressed, and was probably compensating for it by taking his frustrations out on the people around him. But he was fundamentally a good guy. He just needed a life goal or two. It would fix him right up. It had certainly fixed Simon right up. He himself had two life goals. One, being torn apart by, and two, being devoured by lions. And that had made all the difference. The morning rolled on in a series of polite refusals, and soon it came time for lunch. Standing by the break room microwave, Simon marveled at how quickly the day was going. It was to be a short lunch. Simon had been thinking of ways to improve the company's sales script, and since the autodialer gave him only limited opportunities to hash them out on work time, he was thinking of devoting some of his break to the task. Hey, Simon, said one of his co-workers, coming up from behind. Brad, blue-eyed, fair-haired, and a bit on the pudgy side. Simon and he had joined up with the company about the same time, and Brad had quickly latched on to him as a conversational partner. Simon didn't mind. Brad was also a fundamentally good guy. I'm gonna head to Mickey's in a minute. You want I should pick you up some fries or something? Not today, Brad, said Simon, twirling an empty little coated cardboard box in his hands, the erstwhile contents of which were now warming pleasantly in the microwave nearby. Today I'm having rosemary chicken with vegetables. Rosemary, said Brad, frowning. Is that an herb or something? Indeed it is, replied Simon. Brad thought about this for a moment. So you're eating herbs now, he said eventually. Yep, yeah, said Simon. It's only polite, I figure. After all, you are what you eat. Right, Brad? Well, I guess I pretty much gotta be a triple stack of roast beef milk by now, said Brad. Quite possibly, said Simon diplomatically, but for me, no. Simon smiled to himself, his eyes going distant. No, Brad, from here on in, I intend to make myself exceptionally, even exquisitely healthy. And, if possible, he added, herb-flavored. Brad narrowed his eyes. Wait a sec, he said. This isn't the thing about being eaten by the lions again, is it? It will always be the thing about being eaten by the lions, Brad. From here on in, until it occurs. You're obsessed, guy. Simon grinned. Perhaps, he said. Totally, called out Scott from his corner table. He sneered at them around and threw a mouthful of, sh of sandwich. Hey, shut up, said Brad. Make me, fat boy, Scott replied. Then he chopped a piece of onion at him. Little snot, muttered Brad, picking the onion out of his hair. Look, Simon, he said, putting his hand on Simon's shoulder. Little friendly advice. You don't have to be a machine of death slave like this. Don't be trapped by it. Use it to free yourself. Brad spread his arms wide, exposing his substan substantial midsection. I mean, look at me. Can't not, said Scott, swallowing his latest bite. You take up our entire fishable field. Hmm, said Brad, raising both his chins in a dignified fashion and turning his back to Scott's table. Look at me, Simon. Here I am, going to die in a car crash or something. So, I don't worry about the roast beef melts anymore. I don't worry about the soda refills. And I don't worry about getting the chili and the cheese on the fries instead of going healthy and eating them without. He smiled amiably. You see, he said, little changes. I know it won't matter what I eat, so I eat what I want. And I'm happier for it. Brad shook his head then. But you, Simon, you're thinking about this thing all the time now. It can't be good for you. I want to think about this thing all the time, Brad, said Simon earnestly. I'm looking forward to it like you wouldn't believe. 
For Pete's sake, Simon, said Brad. Why? Because, Simon replied, his pale brown eyes as wide as the veldt itself. It will be the most exciting thing that's ever happened to me. Brad shrugged. Suit yourself, he said. But I read in the self-help book my mom gave me that you shouldn't sacrifice you. You shouldn't sacrifice your now just because you're looking forward to being eaten by a bunch of lions at some point in the future. Don't worry, said Simon. I'm not sacrificing my now. I'm happier, healthier, and more vital than I've ever been. He smiled. The thing is, Brad, he said, everything I do for my lions, it makes my life better too. There came the sound of a throat clearing from the door of the break room. Simon looked up. Fennec, said Paul Armbruster, vice president in charge of targeted media solicitation, leaning into the room. When you have a moment, my office, please. Silence. Simon gathered his smile. Certainly, sir, he said, tossing the box from his frozen dinner into a nearby waste container and stepping toward the door. After lunch is fine, said Mr. Armbruster. The tips of his mustache lifted in a tiny grimace, as though someone had invisibly popped by with an eyedropper full of lemon juice and given him a bit. But soon, we need to talk about your performance. Simon's smile did not falter. Performance in the sense of how I'm doing relative to the quota? No, said Mr. Armbruster, sucking on his tongue thoughtfully. Performance in the sense of... Ooh, ooh, look at the dancing bear. Now look, he's riding a little unicycle. That type of performance. Specifically, he added, your performance earlier this morning, Fennec. Right, said Simon, his smile still adamant. After lunch, then? Yes, said Mr. Armbruster, if you please. He then vanished from sight. The subsequent Quiet was broken only by the noise of Scott snickering quietly to himself in the corner. Brad smiled at Simon sheepishly. The microwave went ding. Fennec, said Mr. Armbruster, motioning to the chair opposite his desk with one hand and taking a moment to fine-tune his rather heroic come-over with the other. Sit down, please. You want to speak with me, sir? said Simon, taking a seat. That is, in fact, why you are sitting in my office right now, said Mr. Armbruster. A moment passed as Armbruster sucked on his tongue again for a bit. Then he leaned forward and nudged a small brass dish out from behind him, fancy little wooden desk clock, and over towards Simon. Malted milk ball, he, said, he asked. Don't mind if I do, said Simon, cheerfully helping himself to one. Armbruster regarded Simon as he sat there, crunching. The refrigerator. Sorry about that. You understand, he began, why I brought you in here today? I think so, said Simon, swallowing his candy. You're about to tell me a piece of bad news. Armbruster sighed. Simon, he said, I want to start by telling you that I've been really quite pleased with your newfound gumption and enthusiasm for selling insurance policies over the telephone. You show a level of dedication that is, well, let's say, uncommon in these halls. You remind me a bit of myself when I was your age. Thank you, sir, said Simon. That having been said, said Armbruster, leaning forward even further, I need you to stop describing to our potential customers in gruesome detail how you're going, how you're planning on going to Africa and getting eaten by a lion. Lions, corrected Simon. Lately. My point, said Armbruster, remains a salient one. I see, said Simon, biting his lip. Gruesome detail, though, sir, he asked then. I mean, I realize that I've been a bit chatty on the fact to some of them, but... Armbruster reached beneath his desk and produced a portable cassette player. He clicked at a button. Organ meets, came Simon's voice. Not as desirable as the muscle meats, mind you, which are frequently claimed by the dominant male of the bride, but certainly full of good, nutritious... Armbruster clicked the stop button. The 
clock on the desk ticked a handful of times. Well, yes, said Simon. I can see where you might... I don't know if I'm imparting the proper gravity to this situation, Simon, Mr. Armbruster interrupted. So, I will make it perfectly clear to you that I have no desire to see consolidated amalgamated mutual become known as that place with the guy who's always going on about lions. To this end, I am warning you that I absolutely, positively, will not tolerate any further behavior of this sort. Do we understand one another, Mr. Fennec? Mm-hmm, said Simon cheerily. Armbruster narrowed his eyes at Simon. Let me try this again, he said, taking up a pencil in an attempt to add emphasis to his work. We are talking about losing your job with us, Simon. You don't want to be unemployed in this city, not in this economic climate. Trust me. Simon nodded brightly. I understand, sir, he said. You don't seem like you understand, said Mr. Armbruster. I'm looking for a little solemnity or something. Simon pondered for a moment. Permission to speak freely, sir. This isn't the military, Simon, said Mr. Armbruster. Well, said Simon. He gathered himself. The thing is, sir, it's really hard for me to get worked up at the prospect of losing my job, sir. He raised a hand against Armbruster's objection. No, I, I don't mean that, he continued. I, I will try to restrain myself from talking about my lions to the customers from here on in. But if I can't, Simon shrugged. Well, another job will be on the way. After all, I have to fund my African safari somehow. He smiled. These are more than just idle hopes and dreams now, Mr. Armbruster, he said. They're part of my destiny. Armbruster regarded Simon for a moment, then shook his head. You are a strange little guy, said Armbruster. If you were any less of a salesman, I'd be handing you your pink slip now and personally ushering your behind out of this building while I instructed Stacy to prepare an invoice charging you for the milk ball. But for every lion mutilation story I've got on tape, there's two or more instances of you winning over a stubborn customer on attitude alone. And that's the kind of attitude we need around here. Desperately. Desperately, sir? inquired Simon. Armbruster tapped his pencil on the desk a couple of times. I don't know if I should even be talking with you about this, he said. According to the last board of directors meeting, Consolidated Amalgamated Mutual isn't doing so well. It's not bad, he added quickly, but comparing our first quarter sales to how we were doing two years ago, well, it's sobering, to say the least. And that's company-wide, Simon. It's not just targeted media solicitation across the board. He sighed deeply and tossed his pencil back into the little cup on his desk. It's this damn machine of death thing, Simon, he said. We're in the uncertainty business here. All we've got to offer the world is protection against the frightening, unpredictable future. You give the people something, anything to latch on to, something that gives them a sense of control, even a false one, and suddenly, well, they don't need us anymore. Sure, we'll come through this all right, Simon volunteered. Oh, I know, said Armbruster, pushing his chair back and rising to a stand. I know. We, n we weathered that damn no-call list thing all right, and I suppose we'll pull through this too. Armbruster rounded the desk and patted Simon on the back. Simon stood, sensing his cue. But to do it, said Armbruster, we're going to need all our salesmen giving us 110, or perhaps 15%. Can you do that for me, Simon? Yes, sir, said Simon. Good, said Armbruster, ushering him to the door. Now, get back out there and sell us some policies, all right? Will do, sir, said Simon, disappearing out the door. And no lions, added Mr. Armbruster, calling after him. But if Simon Fennec had a response to this, Mr. Armbruster did not hear it. He sat back against the corner of his desk for a while after Simon had gone, listening to the whir of the air handler and the steady ticking of the clock. Wish I were looking forward to my heart attack like that, said Mr. Armbruster. Night. Home. 
Simon stood at the sink, watching the last few remnants of tonight's dinner of lamb and parmesan orzo out of his good dishes. In fact, Simon only had good dishes nowadays. He had long since donated the bad ones, and even the slightly dodgy ones, to the local thrift shop. The window over his sink was open to the cool night air, and the crickets outside yammered excitedly among themselves, unable to contain their enthusiasm that evening had arrived again, right on schedule. The dishes had been a bit crusty, as they had been left sitting for several hours, and it felt good to Simon to get them all cleaned up. Easier, perhaps, to have tackled them right after dinner, but Simon had run out of time to wash them before his show had come on the television, and the show took clear precedence because it happened to be all about lions tonight. Simon had, naturally, enjoyed every minute of it. And Simon knew how ridiculous this all must seem, this arrangement of his entire life around the concept of being torn apart and devoured by lions. Particularly ridiculous, he felt, was the poster, lionesses of course, he had tacked to the ceiling, preteen girl style, right above his bed, so it would be the last thing he saw at night, every night of his life. The lion-themed comforter, too, he knew, went a bit beyond the pale. But really, honestly, the whole thing? Ridiculous. And, as always, Simon had to conclude that there was really no choice. It was just too exciting. The dishes done and dripping in their wire rack, Simon moved on to an, an invigorating workout on the shiny new exercise bicycle he'd purchased at the mall and from there onto a relaxing shower. Thusly cleaned up for bed, Simon dressed himself in his lion print pajamas, snuggled down beneath his lionine, lionine blankets, and waited for sleep to come. And, as ever, the last sight that greeted him before he finally shut off his bedside lamp was of his lionesses, all in a row, waiting patiently for him and him alone. At night, he dreamed of them, low and tawny, their eyes luminous in the charcoal African dusk. He welcomed them to him, like he might a lover, inviting them into the limits of his light, inviting them to feed. Come, beautiful ones, he whispered to them as they circled close. Come. That story was written by Jeffrey Wells. And the illustration put in the video. It's by Christopher Hastings. Thank you for listening.